I used to be an amateur wildlife photographer. You haven't seen my work, but it was good. Not National Geographic good, but close. In fact, for a while, it took over my whole life. I used to pray that one day, through my shrewd artistic insight, I would capture the visceral truth behind it all. A portfolio so mind-blowing it might remind us, if only for a fleeting second, that it all boils down the ceaseless battle against death. Not taxes or mortgages or Instagram followers. The fight to overcome our environment. Now, that dream has died, and I can't bring myself to lift a camera. The fact that my passion died on the vine may lead you to ask, how could something as cathartic as wildlife photography be ruined? You'll see. In the fall of 2016, I had mustered the courage to quit my day job and pursue my dream of living and working in the wilderness full time. I was nervous, filled with doubt and jittery. What if I failed, I thought. What did I have that a more experienced photographer didn't? And so on and so forth, as I worked myself into a panic, and the landscape of the Grand Tetons, then Yellowstone, filled my windshield. I tried to stop my manic thoughts by swinging through the local grocery store and grabbing a case of beer to bring to the campsite. It didn't work. When I got there, I compulsively flipped through the portfolios of some of my favourite photographers. That only made things worse as the thoughts of self-doubt returned. I can't compete with this. Who am I kidding? This was an ongoing struggle in my life. I would set my sights on a goal, only to be consumed with doubt and quit. I was my worst enemy, and this idea, wildlife photography, was my most recent deluded attempt at success. And so, in typical fashion, I continued wallowing in pathetic self-doubt like that for a while, before finally finding some resolve. I realised I couldn't be a failure this time, not after talking about this dream for months in front of friends. The embarrassment of returning to my parents' basement as a failure would be unbearable. No, I wasn't leaving, even if it killed me. Which it did prove to do, in a way. The only reason I could pull this off, to convince myself I had any shot at all, was because a few weeks before, I had discovered the sort of opportunity that rarely presents itself to a fledgling professional. The opportunity for fame and fortune gained through a single act, and in this case, a single photo. In recent weeks, rumours had emanated from Yellowstone National Park, tall tales of a mythical, large, aggressive black bear. Some trails had been closed off, others were under review. Then, there were the disappearances. A half dozen missing persons who had yet to be recovered. Authorities couldn't find the bodies, so they weren't reported as bear attacks. But anyone who followed the park closely knew. It was him. The King in Black. It was a dumb, macabre name someone had given the gigantic boar because of his track's freakish size. While it was over the top, the name stuck, and everyone was desperate to catch a glimpse. The thing was, nobody had. For one, we knew he was nocturnal, which left only a few photographers willing to brave the night to find him. And also, I think people were terrified of a man-eater. Luckily for me, while self-doubt was a crippling weakness of mine, fear of death mostly eluded me. When I learned that wildlife magazines were now offering 20 
thousand dollars to the photographer that could capture an image of the brute. I was sold. Flipping through the last of the portfolios, now reaffirmed in my aspirations, after once again imagining myself rolling in piles of money and success, I gathered my pack and my huge mag light, threw a few snacks into my bag, and headed for the now closed Cadeth Trail. A long, winding, 30 mile trail that had been the site of the disappearances and the dinner plate sized tracks. The drive was short, and a while later, I arrived at the trailhead and dropped my bag near the aging wooden sign. Eager to get started, I unpacked my bag, clipped my oversized can of bear spray to my belt, and began prepping my camera gear. For a while, I sat there fumbling over lenses, unsure which would be the best for capturing the legend. As I turned a few over in my hands, light poured through the foliage in the direction of the road. Everything all right there, sir? The light said. I put my hand to my brow, trying to glean some of the details from the silhouette behind the torch. Sure is. Can I help you with something? I let my camera hang around my neck and restrain myself from unclipping my bear spray. I thought you were fearless, tracking a man-eater and afraid of a man. I suppose you could, he said, moving the light down towards my legs. It danced across the bag and my shoes. In the darkness, I started to piece together the shape of a ranger's hat. Trails closed. I'm here to capture the shot, I said, holding the camera and trying to look as desperate as possible. Any way you could, you know, let this slide? He rested a hand on his hip and looked down towards the road as a 4x4 groaned up the hill, around the bend, and disappeared from view. He sighed. You got a plan on where you might be staying tonight, or how long you might be heading up this trail? Not sure yet. Just going to take it as it comes, you know? I really wouldn't, he said. Uh, wouldn't what? I asked. Wouldn't do this. And if I was, which I definitely ain't, and you shouldn't, I'd have a plan. An itinerary. You mean itinerary? I said. At that, his lips curled and he took a step forward. His eyes were thin, his rough skin sagging around his sunken eyes. He wore a beige ranger shirt, ripped near the sleeve. On it, a thin trickle of something wet glinted in the artificial light. There was a beat of silence before he spoke. Problem is, people tend to think this is a big joke. They don't realize the kind of hell a bear can bring onto the world. The power of the things, you know. It's ungodly. You think he took them then? The missing people? I know he did. He paused, glancing around a second time. You know, if you end up like the other folks, your family ain't getting any closure. Ain't never gonna be a funeral. How do you know that? Optics, he said. They can't let the family see what he'd done to them. Don't want it to hurt the yearly turnaround, you understand? They're fools, thinking he'll stop. They don't know what he really is. His speech started to grow faster as he got excited and stepped a bit closer to me. I could hear the dryness in his mouth. You see... They found some of them bodies, not all of them, just a few, and they just got rid of them, all quiet like, so nobody from the press catches wind. You're not the press, are you? No, I'm not, but why would they do that? Too graphic? Sure enough, it's a shame too, a piece like that 
ought to be respected for its power. Enough power, it might make you reconsider what it's all about. And you find a woman ripped clean in half like she's nothing more than a piece of overgrown creeper vine. People should see that. Then, they might steer clear. I mean, for Christ's sake, he's nature's harbinger of death. Take these warnings more seriously. This bear is more than a goddamn exit. As he yelled, I felt my hand on the bear spray. Something about him seemed unhinged, but determined to keep my cool so I could continue on, I took a breath and stayed calm. You mean exhibit... Never mind. Listen, thank you for the warning, but my future depends on catching a shot of this thing. All my eggs are in one basket. There was a long pause, and I swear I heard the gears in his head clicking away. Then, he chuckled, adjusted his belt with one hand, and turned the flashlight to his face with the other. Well, you go up that Cadeth trail, you're in his world. In there, he's going to decide your fate one way or another, and if you get too close to him, well, I'll be careful. I'm sure you will, son. They're all careful. I'd just be I miss if I didn't give you a fair warning. Doing my duty, you know. Making sure we all stay bare aware. The last word hung in the air as the light illuminated his jack-o'-lantern face and a whimsical, toothy smile stretched across his cheeks. You have a good night, and if anybody asks, I didn't see you sneaking in here. A while later, there was the creaking sound of a truck door and a sputtering engine, and I was alone again. I should have been terrified. Instead, I felt excited. The thing must be gigantic, majestic even. After sorting my bag out, I walked for a long time, stepping through thistle and sagebrush listening to the white noise from the wind through the pine needles breathe through the mountain valley. I loved it. The moon was full, my eyes adjusted. Now if only I could find something to shoot. But miles later, after hours of hiking the serpentile trail up the mountainside, I'd found nothing. Sore, tired, and feeling defeated, I looked for a spot to throw out my sleep sack and rest a while. Not wanting to sleep on the trail, I found a hardly treaded offshoot that led towards a rocky outcropping. There, there was a large slab of rock that formed a bit of an alcove. Well, not quite a cave, it still provided some shelter from the elements. I shined my light inside, ensuring no other critters had beat me to bed. There was nothing, only a few scattered sticks and a pile of leaves and grass. Satisfied, I unfurled my sleep sack inside and tried to drift away. But my labored breathing kept me awake. Odd, I thought. I'm not winded. Was it the wind? No, the sound was too short. It had to be breath just not mine. Sure, I was losing it. I flicked on my flashlight and slashed it like a saber across the dark forest. Is that an arm sticking out from behind that tree? No, you're just excited. Calm down. But I still heard the breath. It sounded close. And now, shaking with fear, I desperately searched for the source of the noise. Swinging wildly in the blackness, the flashlight's beam fell on the leaf pile beside me. In that moment, I saw the horrible source, the subtle movement. The leafy pile that rose and fell along with the soft sound of breath, and I was frozen. 
when I mustered up the will to investigate, I delicately brushed a few leaves aside with my flashlight, fearful of what might lurk inside. As the leaves fell away, the slack-jawed, pallid face of a man emerged, his eyes empty, void of life. While my inside screamed, I kept my metal and uncovered him. Then he laid naked in the alcove. His clothes had been taken, and, while alive, the bits of grey fat protruding from his partially crushed skull solved the mystery of his blank expression. Huge lacerations covered most of his body, deep claw marks that had torn away swaths of flesh in their wake. My hands shook, and from somewhere beyond my volition, I found myself squaring his image in the viewfinder. Snap. I'm not sure, even now, why I reacted that way. Don't worry, help will be here soon, I said as I covered him with my sleep sack. Hang in there. I thought, maybe, that I saw a reply in his eyes, if only just a slight sparkle. More likely, it was my desperation to believe he wasn't already gone. The ranger's words came back. Nature's harbinger of death. Don't realize the kind of hell. And now, my mind wandered to the monster before. In the same thought, an image floated forward in its place. An infant king swaddled in black fur. When the image faded, I ran along the trail, snaking through the forest, my heart thudding in my chest. Before long, exhausted from sprinting, I had to stop, my laboured panting dominating the soundscape of the otherwise eerily quiet woods. I also looked around as an uneasy wave rose in my gut. Poetry no longer defined this place. It was no longer a serene escape from the modern world. It was a slaughterhouse. Paranoia overtook me and my eyes scanned the forest, feeling like at any moment the thing may charge me from the darkness. Then I heard it. The scream from afar jumped and I knew he was close. For a brief moment, just as the breathing before, I thought the scream was mine. The disembodied sound of a man coming unhinged alone in the dark. Someone falling prey to the horrors of this preternatural wood. But then, as it happened again, I realized it was coming from a nearby gully. Just keep going. You're... He is running out of time. My mind, at least a part of it, knew I should continue. But I now looked down at the camera, dangling from my neck, as something pulled me toward the gully. He could wait, I thought, and veered toward the scream. Screams. Approaching with caution, I stayed low, finding cover near a wooded embankment. A flickering amber light filled the forest below. I laid there, frozen for a moment, before mustering the courage to peek over. In my hesitation, I heard the chuff and the groan of something large and inhuman. More screams. When the scene below came into view, I trembled as both my fears and hopes were realized. There, standing on two legs, towering over a man and a woman near a small campfire, was the king in black. Steam wafted from his huge frame as he lifted himself from the stream between us. The man, with what courage remained in him, heroically faced down the bear. Two orange-tipped cans of bear spray now held in each shaking hand. The woman cursed and fumbled through the camera bag. It's okay, honey, he said. Did you get the picture? We... We'll be fine. Remember, 
Brown lay down, black fight back. Then he sprayed the behemoth. Two vaporous streams shot out from the cans, striking the creature in the eyes. I flinched, expecting the bear to turn tail and run in my direction. But as the spray settled, the beast stood motionless, only exhaling as the capsation-laced rivulets of spray dripped from his monstrous snout. There was no reaction, only horrific invulnerability. The man's eyes widened and he threw down his spray guns, turning to run. A fatal mistake. As he turned, the bear opened his gaping maw and let out an earth-shaking roar. Snap. I couldn't help it. I should have rushed toward them, joining them in their fight for survival. But a part of me, a terrible part, still had a job to do. As the flash of my camera reflected on the pale faces of the photographers below, they were distracted, looking up in my direction, confused. I was sorry, as the momentary pause proved to quicken their demise. He was on them in a fury, a flash of muscle and fur, then blood and flesh. He let out another guttural howl, and at that moment, I heard the battle cry of a great warrior. It sounded almost human, but the thought left me quickly as I watched the king reap his bounty. Nature's harbinger of death. The sound of slashing claws and muffled screams filled the woods as he cut them down one gruesome piece at a time. For a bit, the man struggled in vain, crawling toward me with an outstretched arm before crumpling under the bear's weight. When he laid motionless, the gully fell quiet, sort of. There was still, of course, the sound of my camera's shutter. Snap, snap. From within my viewfinder, I watched the giant creature bask in his mess. Steam, now from the warm blood rather than water, floated above him in a cloud. He seemed bigger than ever, and I soon realized why. In my possessed excitement, I had closed with the madness. My photographer's instincts, working on autopilot, had brought me only a few feet away from him, and as steam poured from his mouth, I could smell the carrion breath. He stood there, studying me, before standing once again. Eight, no, ten feet. This is how you die. I braced for the pain, sure that any second I would be torn limb from limb. The beast's breathing quickened, and then something came over me. A will to live, and even more, a surreal aspiration to succeed in my quest. Snap, snap, snap. For a few seconds, the flashes from my camera were lightning from a storm. Then, sure, I had the picture I came for. I fumbled to remove the memory card. It slid into my hand, then into my pocket, and with no idea how to defend myself, I threw the camera. It landed on the muddy ground with a splat. There was no reaction from the king, only fixed eyes, somehow darker than the night that surrounded us. As the campfire burned, I could see myself in the camera's lens. The reflection pointed upward at me between the huge claws of the beast. The image of a dead man and a coward, a pathetic loser who tucked tail from everything he'd ever tried, who let fear rule his life. And now, my eyes were fixed on the bear. I realized I both envied it and was disgusted by it. 
and while considering that, the beautiful savagery of the thing, something gave way in me. A peculiar emotion stemming from an ancient place within me. Something awakening. A confidence I'd never known possible. I shook as every muscle in my body teemed with power. No longer a man, a beast in my own right. Warm liquid trickled down my leg. Not from fear, but from rage. What are you waiting for, you ugly thing? Let's go. My vision narrowed to only a sharp and lurid half dollar. I pounded my chest. Ready to what? Ready to wrestle this thing if I have to? Who am I right now, I wondered. The beast reacted, retracting for a moment, before bending down to the soil below him. Will he charge me, I wondered. I'm ready then. His focus shifted down, and his breath fogged the camera lens, erasing my reflection. Then, he picked it up. Not in his mouth, like a beast might, but like a man, in his hands. And they were hands now, weren't they? Is that a zipper? I deflated as the head of the demon opened and flipped backward. And there he stood, now somehow standing smaller. It was the same weathered face from before. The Rangers. I recognized it just before the camera hid it away. Snap, snap. Now I was the beast, the spectacle blinded by the rapturous unlocker. He stood there, the camera in his hands, snapping photo after photo. The bear pelt, or costume, bunched around his ankles. The bloodstained ranger shirt hung off of his body. He looks so small, I thought. Then he started shouting. Bear aware, bear aware, they'll be bear aware or say a prayer. Respect the power of the wild, the mighty bear, stay aware. It was the ravings of a madman going on and on until finally, cries still echoing in the darkness, he threw the camera back to me and fell silent. The same toothy smile, now stained pink, regarding me as I flipped the camera again back toward him. Snap. But as I pulled away from the viewfinder, the king had somehow, in the matter of only seconds, returned. Now, he dragged the bodies up the opposite side of the gully, the giant creature still causing my knees to quake, even after knowing him to be a farce. Was he a farce? That man must be over 200 pounds, thrown like a rag doll. Before long, the king and his bounty were gone, sparing me by some logic only known to him before disappearing into the woods. And I was awestruck. I stayed there, overcome with something, something inarticulable. I sat down next to the stream in the dark, and the babbling water kept on until the morning, when there was little left from the night's procession, save for a few brown stains in the soil, a cheap common tent and a smouldering campfire. A while later, I walked back to my car, and, once inside, with the windows rolled all the way up, I screamed, and screamed, and screamed, and etched into my mind's eye. He remained. The king in black. When sanity found me, I found myself driving towards the ranger station and showing them the photos. They were skeptical, but looked thoughtfully and listened. Soon, after they involved the police, they recovered the, now dead, man in the alcove, 
and after that, they caught him. Daniel Richter. No king, only a man. It turns out, he'd walked into the ranger station a decade before, covered in blood, claiming his family was murdered by a black bear insistent that the park wasn't doing enough about bear awareness. He regaled the police with the tale of an aberrant bear that could read his thoughts. He claimed that it tracked him and his family in the woods for days, but he could never escape him. The rangers kept the story quiet after finding no evidence of a bear attack at the scene. They only told authorities, who found the account so nonsensical that he, by some miracle, or perhaps not, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. He had been serving his time in a nearby mental health institution who was now, coincidentally, working with police to find and recapture one, Daniel Richter. The man in the alcove turned out to be Nathaniel Martin, a venerable ranger who was attacked and dumped, his uniform taken. So, it had been Daniel who had given me fair warning. But why? When they caught Daniel, he was alone in the wilderness. The ranger's uniform was in tatters and he lay weak and lifeless, still spouting nonsense about bare awareness. The thing was, nobody could find the bear suit I insisted he wore or any evidence that it existed. We looked at my photo, which revealed the blur of black rising upward over his shoulder in the frame. But nobody believed me. They were convinced the king in black was never a bear at all, that Daniel alone had been responsible for the murders and had adopted an MO that mimicked a bear attack, trying to elude capture. They wagered his family was his first victims. But I had proof, right? What about the pictures of the king himself? They would surely prove that what killed those people was more than a man. Again, nobody believed me. Photoshop, they said. They reviled my story, saying... I was only trying to heighten the mythos of a killer, cash in on the growing legend, and also, as you might expect, the magazines refused the payout. What now? They won't let me speak to Daniel, but I have to know because I can't get him out of my head. Not Daniel, but the king. The image of the king swaddled in black fur. Now I live and wait along the Cadeth Trail. It's been years. I have to do it. I have to know it wasn't only a man in a suit. In fact, I'm quite sure it wasn't. Not a man at all. Not when you get right down to it. It was something older, an ancient and holy inspiration. I believe this because I can feel it, the thing that lurks in the wood. I no longer want to be a wildlife photographer. That dream is dead. Like I said, not because I'm too afraid but because I want something much, much more. I want to feel the freedom from doubt and cowardice and to know the pure power I've only felt as I beheld him. I want to become something magnificent. I find myself no longer interested in wanting to become famous or successful or to find love and belonging. In fact, at this moment... I can't even force myself to eat or shower or dress. I only want one thing. To be wild. To become king.